our next guest, um, I'm thrilled to, um, to welcome her to Self Made Summit. Um, I've only met her on one occasion before, and she is, I think, the most talented, um, and I'm talking irrespective of sex here, comedian working today. She's absolutely brilliant. She's a writer, she acts, um, but her love, of course, is comedy, which I think, um, you know, even though I'm sure there's many of you here who are not thinking about going into comedy, there's a lot of lessons, um, particularly about rejection and failure, um, that we can learn. Um, and Catherine is one of the most honest and outspoken people um, I've met, so I think you should probably all have your notepads ready. Um, so, can you please all join me in welcoming to the stage Catherine Ryan. <laughs> audience you have. Oh, what time have they been here since? Half nine? Half nine. Have you been here since half nine? Jeez. From all over, not just London. <laughs> Do you know that's well, a very this good point? Like, no, I came from... on the train. Look at her. <laughs> yeah, She's like, yeah. and you still had time for that updo. Well, <laughs> good job. Um, Sorry for following Rosie into the toilets, by the way. <laughs> Did you get the internship? No, I didn't. I just thought the Made in Chelsea kids really knew how to have fun. <laughs> and I was like, tired. No, it didn't go that way. Um, Catherine, so yeah. comedy. Yeah. It's not the easiest. I mean, when you start out, if you say to your, your parents, I want to be a comedian, I imagine it's a bit like acting. It's like you're probably going to face quite a lot of hardship, not a lot of money yeah. along the way. Why do it? Because, by the way, Catherine obviously is from Canada and studied town planning at university. I did. Right. Yeah. So what happened? Um, I don't know that anybody goes to their parents and says, says like, there I am. Hi. Um, I don't know that anybody goes to their parents and says, I want to be a comedian. Right. Um, not, I wasn't that personality anyway. I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I think that's really important as a young person to know that like, you do not have to have made that decision yet at all. You just have to be a hustler. And that's what I was. <laughs> I was like always up for a graft. And everything I did, I did it really well. Like No job was too good for me. I was a really good waitress. I was a really good hostess before I was a waitress. I just like, I, I knew that I would never be destitute because I was willing to like get my elbows dirty. Is that the thing? I always get like euphemisms get confused. Uh, is that the saying? It doesn't sound right, but I think that is right, isn't it? Get well, my hands I was, dirty. I was I get ready, my hands dirty. I was ready to get I was ready to get my knees bruised. And so <laughs> I just Yeah, not so sure about that. No, one. not that one's no <laughs> not, not on a Cosmo audience. No. That's not what I meant. I was ready to do it. And um, then I moved to the big city. So I knew I just followed my heart, for lack of a better word. I moved to the big city from my small town because I knew that I would fare better in a big city. I fell in love with city life first. And I loved media. I always loved pop culture. I valued comedy. I didn't consider yet that I would be a comedian. But you did open mic when you were at university. Yeah. Is that right? Mm -hmm. With the intention that you would go into comedy or just the confidence bit? I mean, why would you do that? Yeah, I mean, that is an excellent question. Why would anyone do yeah. open mic? No one's ever good when they start comedy. It's this beautiful way to fail miserably at a right. thing that is very terrifying for most people. Yeah. All types of people say, oh, speaking in public is the worst. It's so scary. But once you've done that and it's gone really badly, then you're not afraid of anything else. How badly so, did it go? Really badly. I mean, I was wearing a Hooters uniform, number one, because <laughs> uh, that was where I waitress next door. And, uh, and I was just like, I, I went to university, I worked uh, at this restaurant called Hooters, which I imagine we'll talk about more later. Does everybody know what Hooters is? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I wonder if they know correctly because... No, this young lady doesn't. Okay, so it's not... <laughs> I opened the first one in Nottingham, you're welcome. It's, um, it is... It's not a nude bar, not that there's anything wrong with burlesque, yep. but it is um, girls in vests and trainers serving wings and beer and being friendly. It's kind of like a cheerleader yeah. um, in, a, in a sports restaurant. Kids eat free on weekends. I had a great time working at Hooters, which is actually a matriarchy. It's really cool, yeah. like-minded women. I'm still friends with 10 years on today that I met working there, so I had a great time. But I was trying to be soft and quiet and I what? wanted to be liked at 18 years old and I wasn't like the girls from my hometown the popular girls the pretty girls I was always saying something that ended up offending 
uh, the majority of my classmates. And I never wanted to be like that. I just wanted seen, to be good. Sorry, but were you seen as eccentric then? I mean, when you were at school then? Uh, that was not the word they used. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did they say? Yeah. Weird. Strange. I mean, you kind right. of had to be an athlete in that town. Right. I was a square peg in a round hole, and I just knew that I needed to get out first. And then um, uh, it wasn't funny to anyone else. And okay. to me, comedy was a language. I wanted to use it to make friends. My mom thought I was funny. I had kind of some family members who appreciate it. But I thought, why isn't everything funny? I just love when things are funny. I, I love watching comedy. I, can, I never know what's going on when it's Oscar season because I just can't handle the darkness of right. like serious films. Um, and then I, I started doing comedy in university just as a fun thing to do. I absolutely didn't think I would be a comedian. I was just trying to exercise that demon in myself so okay. that I could be a good girl at Hooters and at school. Genuinely, I was like, well, comedy club's right next to the Hooters. So I mean, I'll go there, do the amateur nights on a Tuesday. Right. I'll, I'll get that out. And then I can still get back on my path to being this quiet cheerleader. But what happened? Your first open mic night, presumably. Yeah. I'm presuming you failed. Mis I mean, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. And, and, and to an audience of people, yeah. what makes you go back the second time? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I suppose I didn't mind it. Uh, it hurt my feelings. I mean, I was sick every Monday and Tuesday. Right. Before the Tuesday. Before the Tuesday. Before the Tuesday. Before the Tuesday. <laughs> open mic. <light. laughs> And, uh, and I just, it was still, I guess, adrenaline. I did badly, but I saw other people do badly too, and I knew it was okay. And also, I never expected to be good at something right away. My daughter's got this problem where if she can't do something right away, she doesn't want to do it. So right. she'll never learn to play the piano. Yeah. Elle peut pas parler en français. She just <coughs> gives up. And I'm like, mate, you can't be good right away or else everyone will be good. But where did you, was that just naturally within you? Or I know you've talked about, I mean, your father had, um, mm. didn't he have quite a, a tough work ethic? And yeah. was he the one that told you, look, go, go to university, get a solid degree? Because town planning, I know you're interested in cities and, yeah. and, and how they're put together, but why do that degree? And then you didn't use it, actually, did you? Um, well, yeah, my dad and his partner, not his, like, sexual partner. Right. Business partner. I love that we say that over here. But back home, <laughs> his best friend, his business right. partner. I mean, who knows, though? <laughs> what a twist. <laughs> they moved from Ireland. And he grew up, uh, I think, with some financial challenges at that time in Cork. Okay. Um, and he worked for the Cork County Council. And then he and his friend moved over to Canada. Why they chose my horrible small town, I'll never know, but they, um, they have a corporate engineering company there. And my okay. mom is a computer systems analyst and a consultant, and my parents were both uh, just quite academic and quite focused right. on responsibility. And you know, they had three children. It was like, no, you don't run away and be a clown. You have to <laughs> have a backup plan. And I agree okay. with them. I think right. if, if anyone wants to do uh, any job that's risky, and that's not limited to comedy and the arts sure. or whatever. You owe it not to your parents, but to yourself to create a financial cushion and have a backup plan and fund that dream. And there are ways to do it. I know comedians early on who were quite <coughs> happy to sleep in a heap on the floor with like 12 other comics oh. and, and take the night bus and do all sorts of things. And they wouldn't eat for a few days. Yeah. They'd be like, just live in my dream. And I was like, ew, no, I had a day job. <laughs> like, well, I, I wouldn't. I think you have to be prepared, if you want something bad enough, to be working like minimum 60 hours a week. So I'm going to come on to that in a minute about you doing the day job and then also being a, a comedian, mm -hmm. kind of on the side until it shifted. Mm -hmm. But I just want to go to Hooters because um, you interestingly describe you went to university, but you also went to the University of Hooters. Yeah. And I do think there is a, a real thing. Don't laugh. There is a real Hooters University. <laughs> it's a real school. And they have an airline, so. <laughs> but a lot of people, there may be people here who are, you know, they've graduated and maybe they're working in a coffee house. Or yeah. when I graduated, I worked as a, as a door girl for, for a club. And you, you are very dismissive of the, these roles. You're like, oh, it's not what I'm on the path to doing. So you actually don't take much notice. Mm. But for you, tell me how Hooters has helped you later on. I mean, in loads of ways, it's all the things that you don't realize are giving you little, like, whispers about what your future will be. I firmly believe that. 
looking back in my life now, in hindsight, is very useful. I see all these clues that I was going to do stand-up. And it's almost spooky, but I mean, I believe in these things now. I have medical, not medical, metaphysical crystals in my home. But like like I'm weird. Just, oh, like, funny things um, about stand-up. There's a girl that I was friends with. She was with me when I first saw a stand-up comedy show. And this was waitressing at the job that I had before Hooters. Okay. I was waitressing, like, as soon as it was legal. 16, I was a hostess. 18, I was serving drinks. Um, And there was a comedy show there, and I remember everything very clearly, clearly, clearly about that night. And seeing stand-up comedy for the first time and how... Like, what a reaction it gave me, like, in my body and everything. I was like, whoa, I loved it, even though it was probably terrible comedy in retrospect, like, quite hack in my small town. But uh, it was great. They'd, they'd come in and hired a comedian for this private event, and I was with this girl. And then she became a really important figure in my life, too, because later on, like, she died as a result of domestic abuse. God. And, yeah, and this moment and this woman actually became really informed a lot of like my platform and who I am and the things that I care about and the feminist that I am. Okay. Um, but speaking of feminism, Hooters was <laughs> um, really formative because I went there with one intention. I just needed to uh, earn money to yeah. support myself and pay for university. I wanted to have fun. I recognized the brand. It was like colorful and I thought it would teach me to be this cheerleader. But you can't, I think, as hard as you try, your path like, has a way of finding you if you work hard because I met all these other young women. They were so interesting and layered to me. And there was dark within us and there was light within us. We made this choice that we all worked at Hooters. We all lived in the big city. We were most of us from somewhere smaller. Mm-hmm. And I learned that um, we ran that restaurant. You think it's a place where you're a decoration and it very much is. But we were this like little matriarchy and the ones of us that did maths really well and could take on a lot of tables, i.e. responsibilities at once, multitask and work as a team and support each other. We stayed the longest, we made the most money, and we had the best time. And I learned at Hooters, of all the places in the world, I learned at Hooters that being pretty is not the best thing that you could be. And I spent so many years trying to throw my tools away and you really only have one set of tools, so you need to enhance those and sharpen them and learn to, to embrace just whatever the universe has given you. So do you think Hooters made you re- crystallize then that actually I'm not, I've been born funny, that's what I'm good at, I'm great with people, I'm a, I'm a good, did it crystallize there that actually wanting to be this good girl and this, this popular, that was not for you, that's... Yeah, and it, I mean, it's not for, it's okay for some people, but it was not sure. what I was meant to do. And there's a reason I was so bad at it. Yeah, <laughs> I was angry back then, too. I had loads of rows with my mom, and I wasn't happy, and I, I had all this angst. And I don't know, most of that's probably hormonal, but I was not happy. I cried a lot. I was in bad relationships. And it wasn't until I started doing the right path for me, doing what? the right thing, that I just became liberated. I'm the happiest person ever. Everything is just chill for me now and I think you only find that when you get on your path and you have control over your own life. Do you feel, because again correct me if I'm wrong, comedy, Mm. this idea of having control and I think actually it's all anybody really wants is the illusion of having control Mm -hmm. and actually having control of their own life but in comedy where you are at the very beginning, presumably, I mean I don't know, you get paid very little when Mm. you're starting out, you've got to, do you have to hustle for gigs even to get on the stage? You do. Um, I think specifically related to comedy, someone was asking me this the other day, how do you get noticed as a comedian? Uh, You you don't try to get noticed in the beginning and it's better off that you're not noticed. You just have to hone your material and do as many almost secret gigs as you can. When I was jumping on those amateur nights at Hooters, I mean, save for the fact that I was in the uniform, no one knew, I didn't invite people, I didn't shout it out. Then you have to maybe film a short set And then be your own advocate, like hustle and send it out to bookers, send it out to clubs. And you can do that. I mean, my stylist Jen is here. um, And she and I talk about this all the time. There's Jen. Um, This is why I look like this now, and I used to look crazy before. Um, (laughs) In any industry, Jen and I, bless you, always talk about this. Some people are just grafters and will see opportunities and look for more opportunities, um, even when you could be happy with what you have already. 
You do have to, and you can make a life for yourself. Jen's American, and she moved to the UK um, with a bully. And she really had to start over. And Jen reached out to me when she saw me opening for Chelsea Handler in Oxford well, you, Circus. You knew each other before. No, we did not. You didn't know each other. No, Jen So you hustled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she hustled the hustler. Wow. <laughs> and when the hustler gets hustled, what is your response? Do you go, good on you? It, a bit like whoever went into the toilet after Rosie. She didn't yeah. tell me that, by the way. She was probably delighted. No. Um, it was someone from Cosmo who told me laughing. That um, is cute. She's well, a lovely girl, by the way. <laughs> Young woman. Woman. A lovely she's woman. A, she is. A strong, smart woman. She is. <laughs> um, Jen reached out and just said, oh, I saw you, and, and you have this different aesthetic. You dress really well, um, and I think that I could take this I could dress you better, basically. Did you really? And I was like, holy. No. I was wearing leggings because that was my comedy uniform. Anyway. What do you say to that, though? Because I liked it. Well, she's right. Because um, I appreciate Jen as an artist and um, my hair and makeup artist, Fiona. We're kind of this team now. Again, I'm in a team, like right. I was at Hooters, of these really competent, strong women and like a few men sprinkled in yes. here and there for yeah. diversity. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, like Jen, move, moved to the UK with a boy. You did too. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. It's not aspirational. <laughs> <laughs> you find yourself over in the UK. Would you have come here, by the way, if you didn't move? You wouldn't, okay. I didn't want to come here even when I came here. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I just wasn't ready to break up, you know? I didn't want... With, with where? With Canada? Or with... With the boy. With the boy. Because how soon after did that happen? You move over. Yeah. You break up how soon after? Well, again, just with your career and with everything else, I think when, when you're in a bad relationship, you kind of know all along. And it's only hindsight that you go, oh, I want it out all the time. Um, he was moving to London and he said, I think London is this tremendous place for stand-up comedy. You can get on stage a lot. You can grow there. And he was right about that. So God bless him. But um, I didn't want to come because my parents had us in Ireland a lot growing okay. up. And I only really saw my Nana's house because my dad was really protective. He like, wouldn't let us walk down the street. And so I thought, oh, everything's old and made of stone. <laughs> and I was right. Um, but I really didn't want to come. And I had friends. And I had uh, this little community, the safety net in Canada. But for some wild reason, and I still don't know why I did it, I came with him. And then I said, well, I'll try it for a month. I was a brat. He's like, I'll try it here for one month, and then I'm leaving. And I would go back and forth a lot. Did you really? I did, yeah. Well, I had to pick up shifts at Hooters, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I decided, oh, I do like it here. I loved that it was all of a sudden this fresh start, and I come from the small town mentality yep. that still exists on my Facebook. Uh, but I thought, I can do anything I want here. It's really cool. And, Nobody knows who I am. I can go work in that coffee house. I, can, right. I ended up getting a job at Fashion Monitor, which That's is, right. yeah, and they're great for internships, by the way. Um, Fashion and Beauty Monitor, Red Pages. It's all the same company. Um, and so uh, I properly moved here in 2008. And was that scary because, so you're working at Fashion Monitor, you're still doing gigs in the evenings, but you've come to Britain, which I imagine the sense of humour, mm. again, tell me if I'm wrong, it's very different to, say, when you're doing open mic nights in, in yeah. America, or, and even now, I imagine, is it, or is it, is it not? Is it kind of globalised <laughs> humour now? Well, the sense of humour here, definitely, I, I relate to more. Right. And I think it's um, uh, a lot more progressive, it's more inclusive. Acts here that I see on the circuit would be very alternative okay. where I'm from in Canada. Though maybe that's moved on. I can't really speak about a circuit that I've been away from for yeah. 10 years. But certainly at the time, I was used to comedians talking about like drinking and their partners. And here, I, I remember I saw Sarah Pascoe, my very good friend today, on an open mic when I first moved to the UK. And she was talking about Henry VIII. And I was like, who <laughs> is that? I don't know what she was on about. Yeah. And, um, and I'm so lucky that I developed as a British comedian. Because right. I'm from Canada, I have this North American perspective, certainly when it comes to celebrity things. You know, I really still love a lot of their, um, you know, American television and films. I do watch right. all that. I'm into their, their stuff. But um, I, I identify as a British comic. 
And do you think you found your voice in Britain or your voice was always very tailor-made to the British sense of humour and when you got here you were like, this fits, this kind of connects now? Certainly there was a connection and, there a, was. and a fit, but I developed over here. I mean, I learned a lot living over here. I even talk a little bit different than I used to. Do you really? But, but Would you be Madonna, posh now if you went back to Canada? I was always have, posh. You were always in posh. Canada. Oh, okay. I okay. mean, we don't have posh and like working class. I, I suppose is the we don't have it. We're all yes. just friends. <laughs> <laughs> You're all too nice. That's the problem in Canada. We are. We're all really nice. Although, and my sister knows I feel this way. I can't stand my sister's accent anymore. I just can't. <laughs> like I've become a real xenophobe when it comes to Canadian <laughs> accent. I used to watch South Park, and they'd take the mick out of Canadians. I'd be like. How dare they? We don't talk this way. And now I'm like, oh no, we do. We talk like that. That's us. So you moved to England. You're working at Fashion Monitor. Mm -hmm. The relationship, and I'm, talk, I'm, I'm bringing this up because obviously it will feed into the next question, but the relationship breaks down. Yes. And you, you've spoken about this, oh, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And very carefully. Can you tell people just very yeah. quickly? Because yeah. it's, I mean, it's been in your, your routines. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh. So I'm funny, I'm funny when I speak about relationships in my routines because I never want to slander anyone, and it's all basically slander. <laughs> so what I do is, um, sometimes I sound a lot more promiscuous than I am, because I'll be like, this man, and then there's that man, and then they're all the same, like, three men. <laughs> um, my daughter's father and I have a really good relationship now. Yep. You have to, and that has been part of my uh, like maturing and my zen because it's just not worth it. Again, I'm really blessed that my parents split and had a very tumultuous relationship after that. They split one day and never spoke again. And I became the go-between. Do they speak now? No. Really? Farrah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? How old then when what, you were a teenager? I was 15 when they split. Okay. They've never, they were in the same room once at my sister's wedding. Wow. My other sister had the good sense to elope. Oh my word. But even then, they didn't speak. So I was like, oh, wow, we don't want this for Violet. Don't, no. So I'm friends with him. When I talk about another horrible man in my stand-up who was cheating on me with, like, a string of glamour yes, this Yeah, is that it. one. That's this not my one. daughter's father. He so, wishes that was him. That's not my daughter's father. <laughs> but, because, but because of Violet, you split, but you have to stay in the UK because yeah. her dad's here, basically. So, like, in a serious way, it was really difficult because I knew that I wasn't right for Violet's dad, and yeah. I knew that he wasn't right for me, and I knew that I needed to split from him, but it was really tricky because I would not be able to go back to Canada legally, probably, but certainly ethically as yeah. well. I wanted her to see her dad whenever she wanted and vice versa. Um, so it was very Sally Fields uh, in that uh, it's a really good movie. <laughs> Look how young you are. You're like, who? Yes. Mrs. Doubtfire? <laughs> not that one. Um, I couldn't leave, uh, and so I was completely destitute, had no money at all. I was on maternity leave, probably right. still from Fashion Monitor, and I was 3,000 miles away from anybody who loved me. So I was effectively like an immigrant single mom in the most expensive city, just thinking, oh no, what am I going to do? And it, I became really organized. I knew exactly right. which bills needed to be paid exactly which day. It's the most financially organized I've ever been. How poor are we to, like, how destitute at that time were we uh, talking? I mean, I would eat just enough that I, so that I was able to breastfeed. Like, I was star, like, Victorian wow. poor. Wow. <laughs> and even before she was born, when I was expecting her, I still was at Fashion Monitor, right. and milk was free because, I mean, the country needs tea to function. <laughs> um, so I would have a box of Rice Krispies cereal. Sounds like a sponsored ad. I had <laughs> one box of Kellogg's Rice Krispies. Um, and I would bring that in and had it under my desk. And I would just have bowls of cereal because I could put milk in it. Which milk is free. was free. And that's like sometimes all I would eat. And now I wouldn't touch cow's milk with a 10-foot pole. Like I think it's disgusting. But back then, I mean, it was... All, all that I really had. And then I really just, I think this is what's interesting, and I hate to be like a misandrist in any way. I know there are a lot of wonderful men in the world and there are lots of men here today, but there's this special thing about like being a woman and being a mom. Like they do incredible things. I think you, when you're pushed up against a wall anyway, you, you just do as much as you have to do. And it was so simple to me. It was just like, oh, I'm in charge of this baby. She can't work. And um, though in Hollywood, they find a way. Um, 
I was like, I really have to make this work for us. Yeah. And I also didn't want to be wrong. I didn't want to everyone to say, like, oh, well, Catherine, you had such promise right. at Hooters, and now. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm going to make this work. I kind of always believed that I could make it work. And so I started, I was like, well, with, it was, seemed so simple. I was like, well, with stand-up comedy, you work at night. So I can play all day with my baby. Because if I went back to the office, that job I would have earned less than her daycare cost. Wow. And that is really another <laughs> problem with the social system, yeah. uh, dot, dot, dot. But I was like, if I do stand-up comedy, she'll be asleep. So I can just leave her for a few minutes with her dad or whomever I can run out. Or I can bring her with me. And I wore her in a chess carrier That's to right. a lot of gigs. And it was the first time, was she 21 days old? 21 days old. And she, where was this? Latitude Festival? Yeah, because I booked the gig. <laughs> I booked the gig before I knew that having a baby was hard. <laughs> because I was not Googling it. I wasn't reading the books. Right. I did not go to NCT groups or anything. Because I was just very much like, well, generations of women have been having babies. I'll figure it out. Um, so they were like, Catherine, can you do Latitude Festival? Um, <laughs> on this day, and I was like, of course I can. And they were like, well, you might have a baby by then. I was like, it's no problem, because I wasn't turning down work. I right. needed to. Would you take anything? Anything that came, you'd go, it's work, I'm going to take it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think all comedians are like that. You're like that with your passion anyway. Do you still do it, or are you much better now? Uh, no, I don't do anything now. I, I hardly <laughs> do anything now. No, uh, I have the freedom to choose meaningful projects, right. but I didn't at that time. Um, and I love Latitude. I do Latitude still every yeah. year. And Violet's been every single year since she was 21 days old in a chest carrier. And I didn't mention it. <laughs> I was just like, because I didn't have any material about having a baby yet. So I just did the set that I was doing before she was born because <coughs> I was still a beginner. And right. people aren't used to seeing a 21-day-old baby. <laughs> people kept coming up to me and being like, your baby's too small. <laughs> and of course, I was very thin right away because I was starving, people just didn't know what to make of me. Well, you didn't reference, so you, you, I, I mean, it's didn't. pretty cool. You walked on stage, you didn't reference nope. at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> would you have done, if you'd have, if you'd have done differently and sort of had time to think of material, would you have incorporated her into the... I mean, I think if someone's wearing a baby, they should mention it. <laughs> I just didn't, I was not... Uh, like a pro at all. I had no ability to riff, so I was just really like, it was still a new act. So I had, when you're a new act, you're very confined. You can do six minutes or something. <coughs> okay. And I was like, here are my six minutes. And I was really edgy comedy back then. God. I mean, it was not appropriate for any child to hear. Is there video footage of this? Is this probably, on YouTube somewhere? Yeah, it's probably on YouTube. I don't know. I, I forget those times. But if you see any old YouTube footage of me from those dark times, I just looked like Katie Price. I mean, I was skinny, skinny, skinny with these giant boobs and no clothes to accommodate the way my body had changed. And, and then it, it's so difficult. It, it, when I'd be gigging and touring, I'd be on the train, and like sometimes if anybody has been a new mom, like you just, your shirt is soaking wet, I'll just keep living my day. <laughs> yeah, I think you block those times out. I forget. What gets you through that? Because at that point, you're still, I mean, you're starting to get work. Mm -hmm. You've got a newborn baby. You're poor. You're single at this point, so you're... Not yet. Just like in spirit. OK. Um, but the exhaust, I mean, you must be exhausted. Mm. And presumably, I don't know, but those are, they're still fairly early gigs. So presumably, sometimes you die in front of an audience, yeah. sometimes you don't. What keeps you going? Like, when, if someone here is having a really, really relentlessly difficult time, mm. I mean, how do you get through it? I think part of it is uh, just the way that you are. Innately, certain people are more sensitive than other people. I had this understanding really early on that I was not the most important thing in the world. Right. And still, I want people who come to see me on tour to have a nice night, and I appreciate that they probably have very few nights out, as I have very few nights out. But I also accept that I don't have ultimate power, and I can't. Yeah. You can't be liked by everyone. And uh, in any job, there will be people there who are really difficult to work with or who talk behind your back. Or you might have a boss that gives you like, a lot of trouble and you feel like a failure a lot. But not everyone is going to like you. You can only do your best. And that sounds so simple. I think a lot of the, the ultimate truths in life are so, so, so simple. 
um, even when I was in school and being bullied, or even when I first started doing this show in Canada, this really small show on our version of MTV, before social media or anything else, people would write on forums how much they hated me. And I would go to this website. I don't know if it still exists. I would go to IHateBeyonce.com. And I would read horrible things about Beyonce. Because <laughs> I'd be like, well, if people hate Beyonce, then. <laughs> and it's true. And, and we all like different things. And I think that's really beautiful about us. And then I've been reading this like First Nations uh, doctor guy. Right. And this is getting spiritual again, so get ready. Um, he talks about generational healing, so anything, and, and generational trauma, so anything that happens to you happens with this seven generation ripple, and anything that happened to your great grand is kind of like rippling into you some bit, but you also have power to heal backwards and forwards in generations. And he talks about suffering and how, of course, no one wants suffering, but you always come out of it better than you went in. Right. And anybody knows from a hardship they've had or a breakup or anything else, um, that you always, you don't want him after you've been through all the suffering or her. You're like, oh, because you're better than you were eight months ago when you went in. And so all the periods of suffering, yep. whether that be a difficult run of gigs or failure here or being poor or broken down relationships, I really feel blessed by them and I thank them for their service. But that's, would you say that that's built up over time though? Because, yeah, yeah I mean, I, I know at school you probably cared less than some, but still you wanted to be popular, you wanted to be, it, mm -hmm. it was difficult being a eccentric. Yeah. How, do you think it's just repeatedly almost kind of walking into the fire, so to speak, and realizing that actually you're gonna be okay? Yeah. Is that how you've built up this kind of tenacity? Well, Yes, and there is a saying, and I, I think it's Steve Martin, an incredible comedian and artist, who said, and I'll get the quote wrong, but it's, uh, in the absence of talent, tenacity is a great alternative. Right. And you will encounter in your life people in higher stations than you, and you go, how did they get there? Like, they're an absolute moron. And they will be, and it'll be tenacity. Right. And so if you have both, if you have talent and tenacity, then you really, I really believe you can conquer the world. Like, there is no way that I should have the level of, like, freedom and success in UK comedy that I have now. I absolutely don't deserve it. I'm from this, like, tiny town where I could have and should have probably just, like, married my neighbor, <laughs> you know, like, cross my fingers that we weren't related. <laughs> And I was just almost, I had this apathy that I, I didn't even realize how hard the things that I was getting into were. And when I was knocked down, I would just get, I just had this like, no, well, oops, well, I'll just try this again. And if you do that enough times, it will work for you. And I just can't stress that enough. Again, it sounds crazy and it sounds simple, but I just filmed a show for Channel 4 called How'd You Get So Rich? And I interviewed millionaires and billionaires. Yeah. And, um, and they were all so similar. They had different ideas. But they had a lot of um, common threads. People told them they were crazy. Uh, they were all very poor at one point. They were all self-made. Hashtag self-made. <laughs> and, um, and they just didn't take no for an answer. And they kept at it. They believed in the idea that they had. And they surrounded themselves with good people and made the right moves. They were tenacious. And it ended up working out for them. I've just noticed we are, we are running short on time, but very quickly, okay. because now, now you've come full circle, you're very successful, you're at a point where you can turn down whatever, but do you get rejected now? I mean, does it, does it still happen to someone like you? We imagine yeah. it doesn't. Yeah, I um, just filmed a pilot for the BBC with my friends Ramesh Ranganathan and Joel yeah. Isaac, who are so amazing. We did it with Hat Trick, a production company that we love, yeah. and it was, um, the BBC had been really public about, like, they're looking for their next, like, almost SNL or late night political entertainment chat show. Right. And we made a pilot for them, it was so much fun. We had this like really modern brass band and um, they decided they didn't want to make it. And they went instead with a show that my friend Nish Kumar is right. fronting and he's super talented as well. And had that been a lifeline, jobs used to be lifelines for me. I'd be right. like, oh, I need to get this or else I'm not going to be able to eat tomorrow. Like those, they used to be so important and no hurts so much yeah. when it's like 
yes or Rice Krispies. Um, <laughs> but now, of coming from a different viewpoint, I, I welcome no. I'm like, oh, well, there's a reason that that decision was made. It was probably the right decision. And I'm really zen about it now. And I would have loved to make that show with my friends. But I also think that you know, Nish's show is going to be incredible, and I can't wait to watch that. And it's like, no, you're going to hear no. And yeah. I feel balanced when I hear it. Because then like, I, I think I'm less likely to be struck by lightning to make up for <laughs> like, what an evil person I am. Well, I think we would all love to, love to see that show by the sounds of it. Does yeah. anybody have any questions? Um, very quickly, there is a mic going around. If anyone does, if not, we'll just continue. Yes. Sorry that I've like, had my back to all of you. Hello. Is there a microphone? Hi. Um, what was the moment that you knew you'd made it? How did you get out of all that? And when did you know that this was a proper career and you are going to be famous? Um, uh, I think it's really important not to ever think that you've made it. I don't really know anybody who feels safe, like they've made it. And if I did know them, I probably wouldn't want to hang around with them. <laughs> like, you've just described me as a horrible prick there. Uh, <laughs> when did you know you were so famous? <laughs> Thank you for your, your question. Um, I think as soon as you feel that you've achieved everything that you can in one space, then you have to find new challenges. Like I've been, I just got back yesterday from New York because I have a stand-up special on Netflix that some people love and some people hate. And so I'm going out to America and I have to start over when I'm there, doing like five minutes again on open mic. Some people don't know who I am and they don't care and they don't think I'm funny. I love that. And, uh, and all of us, all my peers in comedy, Sarah and Ashling and Ramesh and Joe, we all feel like, uh, this fraud syndrome where we're like, oh, one day they're just going to realize that I'm not that funny after all. And I think it's important to have that because it keeps you really hungry. But when did I realize that things were maybe going to be okay? Uh, hmm. Yeah, no, I could have it all taken away. I'm like one scandal away from <laughs> <laughs> nothing. So yeah, no, I'm a lot happier and more comfortable now, but I, ha I still have like more work to do. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Any more questions? Um, where's the microphone? Uh, there's just one right near you there, actually. Um, was there a point, that's really loud, was there a point that you realised that you didn't have to, um, well, how do I this? Because you're funny in person, obviously, exactly. and you're funny on stage, but stage is scripted, yeah. and you're not right now. Was there a point when you realised, oh, I don't have to script, like I'm, I'm just performing right now, but it's me? Do you, know, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I do. I know what you mean. And don't ever apologize for having a loud voice because we all want to hear you. <laughs> um, I think that, you know when you walk into maybe a group of friends that you don't know or you feel awkward or you're embarrassed or maybe you're on a first date or something, then you're not funny and you say horrible things uh, because you're not comfortable. I think that the only time that you can be funny or effective or successful is when you feel confident and comfortable. And I knew coming here, like I've spoken with Farah before, I'm a big fan of the magazine, and um, I knew that you had all come here on purpose, and so we were probably kind of like-minded. And I think it's really hard to be a millennial right now looking for employment and mapping out your career and your destiny. Like I relate to you guys so much that I just was like, oh, these will be like my friends, my people, so I could just be comfortable. But I'm not always funny in person. Ask the other moms on the school run. <laughs> they hate me a lot. <laughs> They're like, why is she in a bathrobe again? I'm like, <laughs> why does she keep putting wine in that coffee mug? <laughs> um, just the lady here. This is coffee, though. <laughs> Hi. Um, you um, make funny things about painful periods in your life. And I wanted to know how you got to that point where, you know, I can, I can, I'm strong enough to talk about my life and it to be entertaining to other people. And I don't mind people laughing about, you know, a breakup or this, yeah. this painful period. Where did you get to that point? Um. Thank you for that question. I like that you know what my comedy is about, so thanks. Um, I was always like that. Like I 
I was always a kid who would laugh at funerals and get told off. And I don't think it's funny when people die, but I mean, I would just find something funny. Like my, we were so close to my grandma. We spent loads of time with her. And when she died, she had this pianist at her, a pianist at her funeral who my sisters and I decided looked like a lamb. And she really looked like a lamb. Like, we didn't have phones back then, so I couldn't take pictures. But we were laughing and laughing and laughing and laughing. I was with my sisters, and that made it better for us. We were children, and nobody really told us off because they were like, oh, these children are so traumatized that like, they're <laughs> laughing. But it made us really uncomfortable. Uh, we were sad that our grandma was dead. My mother was crying. My mom never cried. And we laughed about it, and it made it better for us. And then I think that's just always been my sense of humor. I had um, cancer when I was 21, maybe not it's very, it was melanoma, which is kind of a serious, which you should all be checked for, even if you're 21, uh, especially if you're tanning. Um, and that, it wasn't so serious that I had to have chemo or anything, but I had like two surgeries on my leg and I still have this like strange like chunk out of my leg. And then when I started doing stand up, I would talk about that yeah. because cancer is something that has touched every family in some way and it is really awful. And I thought, oh well, there are funny things about it too. No, people were not ready for that. But, um, <laughs> and then with breakups, I have to get something out of a horrible experience. Otherwise, I wasted three years with like the worst man I've ever met. Why would I do that unless I can use it to A, like grow, but also I've had people come up to me and say, oh, the same thing happened to me and it's really cool that you talk about it. And I'm totally fine being vulnerable. You have to, if I'm going to, do any kind of comedy roasting and talk about celebrities and be awful, seemingly awful about them, I have to show that I'm not being awful. To me, it's just a language and I do it about myself more than anyone else. So there will be people who don't agree with me who think there's no room for comedy with dark stuff, but I just think that's like the best thing to do. Comedians are not trying to hurt your feelings. We're trying to make things lighter, even when they're dark. Uh, any more questions very quickly? How are we doing for time? Where's the time person? Who's keeping an eye on time? Is it you? Yeah, one more question. One more question. Is there someone near you just there? Lady here. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, where, do you get, where did you get your confidence from when you first started out? Obviously, you're going to have a load of people possibly not finding you funny. Where did you get yeah. that confidence from to start? Um, how old are you? 18. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. No, 18, I had no confidence. 18, I had... Zero <laughs> confidence. I wouldn't have even had the confidence to like come here with my friends, mm -hmm. do anything really for myself. Um, I had a, certainly the confidence to try. Uh, oh, it's really hard for me to remember because I'm so old now. <laughs> Standing in front of people. Yeah. I don't know if I would describe it as confidence because I think confidence is really quiet. Like I have quiet confidence now where um, I'm just happy hanging out with myself. I could be home on a Friday night. I don't worry if people dislike me. I get really hateful messages on the internet and I'm like, ha, no, that's a pretty good joke actually. That's cool. <laughs> like, I do, like now I have quiet confidence. At 18, I was really tumultuous within myself and I didn't have confidence. I just had this this um, idea that it didn't really matter that much if I failed. And I don't know how I would describe that. Is that like apathy, maybe? I, I didn't really understand. The, I think probably I did comedy because I had such low confidence that I was like, who cares if this goes wrong? Everybody hates me anyway. Like, I think <laughs> I just, um, and I was in a different city. I think it's really important to leave where you're from, at least for a little bit of time, and be completely anonymous again. Because in a small town or where you've gone to school or where you grew up, everybody knows who you are. In Toronto, which was like four hours from where I was from, nobody knew me in those comedy clubs anyway. I'd be more nervous doing something in front of my mom or people I knew than strangers. They're just strangers. Most people are strangers. <laughs> and uh, it really doesn't matter what they think of you. Like, it really really doesn't. Think of the best person that you love. There are people who hate that person. And then think of the worst person. And they will have like millions of fans. Like the, the whole alt-right right now is really confusing me. 
because they have websites and they have fans and they have they've like monetized <laughs> yes. being a modern yes. Nazi. Yes. So whatever you are, you will find people who support you. You just have to not be afraid. Otherwise, it's never going to happen for you. If you do nothing, nothing will happen. Have we got time for any more questions or no? Okay, okay, fine. Um, Catherine, thank you so much. Such a brilliant, brilliant, thank honest you. call. Thank you.